In case you wonder why I'm sitting down and these guys are helping me out, I've, no, I've been known to uh, pass out <laughs> if I stand too long. Now, someone might say, well, why don't you shorten the lessons? <laughs> After preaching for 40 years, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so you might as well be comfortable, and we'll get to it. Every once in a while, something happens that will spur you to think that you're on the right track. And that happened to me this morning. I always wonder about the lessons that I prepare. Are they, they useful? Are they helpful? And this morning, I was so surprised when I opened the newspaper and there was a heading, the guard asked me, do you want to be in a tank with your homeboys? I said, no, I'm going to change my life for God. The entire front page of today's newspaper is devoted to a young man who decided, determined to change his life for God. And then then huge letters was this comment, how to change a life. I've been thinking about the passages in the New Testament that talk about the set of the mind, the determination, if you please, to do the right thing, to put God first. It's not always easy. And yet I think that as we go through our study this morning, and with the idea of this young man who lives here in Yakima, who'd been in prison, who had been a gang member, who had done so many different things, that somewhere along the line, he determined to change his life, which tells us something of the power of the gospel. When he was in prison, his parents had given him a Bible for his birthday. I don't know if he read it then, but he read it. And ultimately, it led him to want to change his life. I ask you to turn in your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to meet two groups of people. Each had problems with the understanding that they needed to get the most out of a relationship to Christ. We're not going to have anything on the screen this morning, but there are Bibles in the, in the racks behind the tables or behind the benches. And so you'll be able to, to follow along with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And though the words may be a little different in a different translation, you'll get the thought. As we read the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read two groups of people who are so completely different that it makes us want to think about them. First of all will be the Pharisees and the, scri and the Sadducees. But then we're going to move on and read about a group of disciples, probably apostles, and what Jesus has to say to each group is rather interesting. And so read with me for the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came up testing Jesus. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but do not discern the significance of the times? An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Sign will not, they will seek a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. The disciples came to him with the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring bread. Jesus said to them, 
Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said, because we did not bring bread. Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves, the five thousand, and how many basketfuls were picked up? Or the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many large baskets full were picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but because of the leaven of the Pharisees? Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I want you to think for a moment with me about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They could read the weather. They could understand the weather. But they could not understand Jesus. What was going through their mind that they could understand on the one hand, but on the other hand, which would have been far more important to their lives, they could not understand. There are multitudes of people today who can understand very in-depth things, but can't understand the place of Christ in their lives. You and I, somewhere along the line, have begun to understand the place of Christ in our lives. We're better for it. There are things that make sense with Christ that don't make sense without him. But then come down to the disciples. They were followers of Christ. And yet their understanding had slipped into such a simple thing as we forgot to bring bread. There were earthly things that were important, the bread. But Jesus was not talking to them about literal bread, but about the teachings that could help or hurt them. And so we have two different classes of people, and their understanding was a challenge. The Pharisees and the Sadducees would never come to the knowledge of the truth. The disciples would begin to understand, we have to be careful. We have to always strive to understand what Jesus has for us. And they did understand. Before we leave Matthew chapter 16, come with me over to verses 16 and 17. And this time, we're looking at Peter. Jesus has asked his disciples, who do men say that I the son of man am? Well, they had given a number of different Old Testament prophets but then finally, Simon Peter, in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Well done, Peter. But then drop down to verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it. Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. And Peter reminds us how easy it is for us, on the one hand, to be very spiritually minded. And then something happens. And we slip into the common, ordinary grievances, situations that take our mind away. It's so easy when we gather together as a congregation when we open our songbooks and sing praise to God, we will partake of the communion and remember the sacrifice of Christ. When we shall open our Bibles and study as we are right now, and yet a couple of hours from now, 
that can all be pushed aside. And we'll be thinking about things that really don't matter all that much. There's a little passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that will help us to understand what we're dealing with with our minds. And so turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a small verse, but a powerful verse. He's talking about the natural man and the spiritual man. Listen to the language of verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Somewhere along the line, the natural man doesn't realize what's happening to him, that what could help was foolishness to him. I think of the young man written up in the pages of the paper this morning. There were times when if you had approached him about spiritual matters, he would say to you, oh, that's just foolishness. But somewhere along the line, for some reason or another, all of a sudden, it began to make sense. His spiritual thinking, his spiritual mind was awakened. I'm persuaded that God is able to open up our minds to refer to Scripture, to be touched by it, if you please. And so that young man said something to my mind this morning as I read about him. And then we look at the spiritual appraisal. How do you look at things? How do you look at life? How do you look at family? How do you look at your loved ones? How do you look at just the joys around us? It has a lot to do with a Christ is foolishness or you can spiritually appraise what life needs to be. One of the national news a couple of weeks ago, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I was surprised. I know that the commentator is a member of the Church of Christ in New York. But he had a deal about how the people from Ukraine who are having to leave, who are now uh, trying to make a life in another country, gather together for prayer. You can't take away that spiritual need that is within us. Oftentimes, it's cast aside when everything is going well for us. Let things get a little difficult, a little challenging, without answers. And we do pray. When I was preaching, used to visit the sick in the hospitals. Oftentimes there would be more than one individual in a room. Never, ever, when I would ask the other individual who I wasn't visiting, Do you mind if I include you in my prayer? They would say, oh, yes, please do. You may have a neighbor, a friend, who has asked you to pray for them. Why is it that when difficult times come, we want that prayer? We want connection to God. Well, the young man in the newspaper could give you an answer. And the Apostle Paul could give us an answer here. He at one time was an individual that persecuted the church. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. And somewhere along the line, something was awakened in Paul. And he can write about the natural man. It's all foolishness to him. But the spiritual man, he can appraise things in a uniquely different way. Then there is another passage that I want us to take note of because it will help us to understand this very thing. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. 
to Romans chapter 8. I was going to read from verses 5 through 8, but I think I'll go to the beginning of the chapter because it's so unique. If you go back to verse 25 of chapter 7, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. I've written alongside of that, which is the strongest? The mind of the Spirit of God or the mind of flesh? Let me give you a definition of both. The mind of the Spirit of God is what you are with the influence of God in your life. Flesh is what you are without the influence of God. If God has no place in an individual's life, Paul will call him fleshly, fleshly. Now drop down with me to chapter 8. This is Paul's answer to himself. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now watch very carefully the reading of verses 5 through 8. Those who are according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Notice the words, set the mind. On occasion you will look at a little kid who tells you very clearly, my mind is is set in a certain way. Determination. Well, we have to deal with that sometime. But we as adults have that look too on occasion. Ever see somebody who you can know by their facial features? Their mind is not going to be changed. That's the way it's set. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. But here, it's good. The mind set on the Spirit of God. There's an occasion when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, there to be crucified. It says that he sets his mind to go to Jerusalem. Every step of the way, Jesus' mind was not playing tricks on him. There was a determination in his facial features. There was a determined in every step. And so come down now to verse 6. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. A moment ago in the scripture reading, if in you were raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on things above. No matter how long you have been in the church, no, longer, no matter how long you've been a Christian, there is the need for determination to set the mind, not be moved. The COVID has done a hard number on Christians. It has been so easy to find reasons not to join with the saints, to be focused on the things of the body and how to escape the COVID. But the set of the mind is so needed in this day and age. Our world is in a turmoil from one end to the other in so many different ways. And what can help us is the set of the mind. Look again at that verse, verse 6. The mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. 
You want peace in your mind. There's one way, according to Paul. And then one more time, verse 7. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. But those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why? Simply because their mind is going another way. When I was working on this lesson, I thought, well, if you have these passages that talk about the mindset on the flesh, it is a bad thing. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Then there's got to be some passages that will help us with this mindset, with this setting of the mind. This, I like the words spiritual stubbornness is what we need. Well, I found some. And so I'd like to share a few with you. First of all, well, we're here in Romans chapter 8. Take to heart, verses 5 through 8. Take to heart that there are two ways of your mind going. One fleshly, without the influence of God. And one spiritually, with the influence of God. And you know, it is so subtle, so subtle that our minds can be influenced by God. The good things that people do. God is not just the God of rules. Years and years ago, Time Magazine had a full page article, God is dead. Well, he wasn't dead. He had just stepped out of the picture for a lot of people. But on the other hand, he is very much alive. Most of the network news will close with something very positive that someone is doing to help others. God is very much alive and active in the hearts and the minds of people. It has been so, so often said, it's amazing, the people that have been fleeing Ukraine and how they've been welcomed with open arms, their homes, their feelings for them. God is at work in the minds of us if we'll just let him. The mind set on the Spirit of God is life and peace. And so I look at those verses, five through eight, and I think, okay, that's one thing. I want my mind set on the Spirit of God. The actions toward others, the actions in my life, what I decide, those fit right in verses five through eight. And then again, this congregation is right now being encouraged to be daily Bible readers. I'm reminded of a passage of Scripture that the Apostle Peter passed on to his people. Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. And then we have Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. We have Peter's admonition, desire the sincere milk of the word. Interesting that the young man that you'll read about on the front page, every picture that they have of him, he has his Bible in his hand. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool. And it works on the minds of who of those who will allow it. But then I've got another one. Worship. Do you realize what we're doing right now is so different 
than what you do the rest of the week or what the average citizen out there is doing with his hour. We've come together because we want to be together. Nobody forced you to be here. Well, maybe little kids. But nobody forced the adults. You're here. Why? Because worship has an effect on our minds. It's so different than the rest of the day, the rest of the time that we go through week by week. We need it. We, re- we need it. This is spiritual exercise. Spiritual. Think of worship as spiritual exercise. Our voices sing. Our ears listen. And we go away spiritually closer to God, closer to his son. But then I thought of Jesus in John 4, verse 23 through 24. He meets a woman at a well. His disciples have gone into town to get food. She comes to him and he says, would you give me a drink? He says, well, yeah, I guess so. I'll give you living water. And then he responds this way. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And that spirit is your spirit. And truth is what comes out of the New Testament. And then we come over to Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Well-known passage of scripture, because it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a custom of some, but exhorting one another as the day draws near. You ever say to somebody who shows up after being gone for a few, I missed you, I missed you, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, but encouraging one another. Why? Because it's good for our spirits. And then I'm going to close one more. Turn over to Philippians. Because there are three here. There are three things that will help us in this spiritual quest for setting our minds on spiritual things. I want to look at verse 4 through 8. And you can count them. There should be three of them. And the first one, I must say this. Paul is a prisoner in Rome. Doesn't know what's going to happen to him when he writes this. Verse 4 of chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellent, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Three things that will help you spiritually. Rejoice. In a minute, we're going to sing my favorite song. Count your blessings. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter, no matter what's going on in your life, there are some blessings. Count your blessings. Paul, from a Roman prison, writes to the Philippian Christians, rejoice. And again, I will say rejoice. Count your blessings. Spiritual blessings. And then he goes on to point out the importance of prayer. Jesus himself, in his Sermon on the Mount, taught that it be good to go into your closet and pray just you and God. You know, one of the amazing things about prayer is that you can do that. Prayer doesn't need to be 
just in the confines of this building. It doesn't need to be just with somebody leading you in prayer. Prayer can be the most private, most quiet, most gentle, in the closet kind of thing. You don't even need to shut your eyes. You can be walking down a path, walking down a street, and in communion with God about your next step. And then finally, if we're talking about the set of the mind, if we're talking about what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were missing in our text of Matthew 16, what the disciples needed to hone in on is think. And he has a whole list of things to turn your mind to, and there'll be a blessing. And so as we look at our world today, Look at the front page of the paper about a man who determined that he was going to change his life for God. It's a big work. We're already on the path changing our lives for God. But like those disciples, we have to work at it. We can't let our minds slip away from it. They worried about how much bread they'd brought when they said needed to be worried about the false teaching of the Pharisees and the scribes. I want to close with a little passage from 3 John 2. But before that, since Kevin is going to be gone next Sunday, I'm going to preach again. And I want to introduce you to a man next Sunday who personifies the set of the mind. Determination is his bloodline. And so I hope you'll be here to meet him. He'll be helpful to you. In 3 John 2, John, an old man, writes this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Soul and spirit prosper just as your body prospers. We're concerned about our physical well-being. May we also be concerned about the set of our minds that we not be just natural, but that we be spiritually acclimated. And life close to Christ is so much a better life than without him. If there's some way we can help you this morning, whether it's to set up a study with you, to pray with you, our elder will, Walt will come and be standing here at the front to welcome you, to help you out. I will sit down. Let's stand and sing our invitation song. And as we're singing, you count your blessings.